<laughs> Let's continue our discussion on Ruth Array, uh, which we started in the previous class. Uh, we are looking at 1870s, when there was no computer, no MATLAB, no Mathematica, no Wolfram Alpha. And we needed to know whether a transfer function has all poles in the negative half plane or not. Okay? And the idea that Ruth came up with was to use some uh, deep results in complex analysis to develop an array and look at the first column in array. Uh, and the main result is number of sign changes in first column is equal to number of poles in uh, with positive real part. Now the situation is a little bit problematic when you have zeros in the first column or you have zeros across the row because then you won't be able to compute the root array subsequent to that. So what we want to discuss today is situations where you encounter zeros in the first column, zeros in entire row, and then some uh, other ramifications of that type. <clears throat> so in the previous class, we did case one, and we have uh, done a couple of examples about that, uh, where all entries in first column are non-zero. So when things are non-zero, life is good. Just count the number of sign changes and that tells you whether the system is unstable or not. Uh, if the system is stable, there will be no sign changes. Case two, uh, there is a row non-zero row with first entry zero. Okay, let's see why that is problematic. So I'm going to construct a root array, Sn, Sn minus one, Sn minus two, Okay, and then you construct in a similar fashion.
Now what happens when a n minus 1 is equal to 0? Let's think about it. I can't compute this term. I can't compute this term. I can't compute any of the terms of this row, right? So we need to do something about it. And the idea is that if you have a non-zero row, so this row is non-zero, but the first entry is zero, then you replace zero by epsilon. Then replace zero by epsilon. Okay? Epsilon is some small number, and this epsilon will have the same sign as a n minus one. Oh, well, a n minus one was equal to zero, so you will have epsilon here, and then use the same sign as a n for epsilon. Zero by epsilon and use the same sign as in the previous rows first entry. Okay? In case three, okay. So we have the first case where the first column is non-zero; all entries are non-zero, so we are good. Second case is we are looking at the first column, and one of the term turns out to be equal to zero. So now we have we are in trouble, and the idea is well, replace that with epsilon, and then proceed by filling up the entire table, okay? What could be the third case? Yeah? They're all zeros. All zeros, so the entire row becomes zero. Okay, so let's say row corresponding to S raised to M is zero. Uh, so then, let, uh, I want to give it a name that we haven't used so far. So, QR, have we used R before? Oh, oh R is the transfer, uh, yeah, R is the reference signal. Let's say V. Have we used V before? No, we have not. Okay. So let V S be the polynomial formed from S raised to from the entries of S raised to M plus 1. Con complete route array for d of s over v of s. Okay, so divide this vs, which is the polynomial, from d of s, which is the denominator of the transfer function, and then complete the root array.
this polynomial is known as auxiliary polynomial. This is known as auxiliary polynomial. Okay, and what we will see is that the uh, transfer function d, uh, the, sorry, the uh, the polynomial ds can be completely divided by the auxiliary polynomial v of s. So we'll see that in a in a minute. And then the last situation would be when multiple rows become zero, which is like the worst case you can get into. Uh, and you have to use, so in, in case multiple rows become zero, you have to use a combination of case two and case three. So we'll look at uh, an example for that. Okay. So case one is something that we did in the previous class. So let's look at an example with case two. Uh, should I delete this? Okay. Okay. The first, let me delete this part. So I need to start from S cube, S square, S raised to one, and S raised to zero. What should I write here? This should be one, four, two, and eight. Uh, yeah. Sorry, this is an example for case three or just this is an example for case two. Case two? Yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, I see. This is an example for case three, actually. You're right. Okay. So this is an example for case three. Let's do case two example later. Okay. Uh, what should the coefficient for S1 be? Let's uh, compute it. So minus one over two, determinant of one, two, four, eight, and this is equal to zero. We don't have anything, so I'm gonna write zero there. Okay, so I have zero, zero as the entire row and I need to complete the table all the way up to S naught. So I'm in trouble because I can't figure out how many sign changes, sign changes are there in this particular denominator, the poles of the denominator. So I'm gonna form an auxiliary polynomial V of S and V of S would be constructed from the polynomial of S square, because this term is, this row is zero, so I need to go one row above it, and I form two S square plus eight. That's it. Okay, that's my auxiliary polynomial. The important thing to note here is that, uh, this term would be multiplied to S square, and this term will be multiplied to S raised to zero, which is equal to one, which is what I'm doing. So successive terms always have a difference of S square, okay? Not uh, S. Okay, 
Now that I have formed the auxiliary polynomial, I now need to divide it by d of s. So d of s is given here. So let's uh, do it on the other side. So I have 2 s squared plus 8. And then I have Okay. Uh, let me wait for you to write it down and then we'll do the division together. Has, has any of you done divisions like this before? A few of you, okay. So let's try to do that again. Uh, so I'm going to multiply it by one over two s in order to kill the first uh, term of this polynomial, the highest degree term of this polynomial. That gives me s cubed plus uh, 4s. I subtract it. I get 2s squared plus 8. Yes. Can't we divide it by just using factorization to the right? Like s cubed plus x squared, like take the common factor as s squared. S plus, like we can factorize the the new office term. That's right. I mean, you can factorize it because it's an easy polynomial, but you may not be able to factorize it if it was complicated one. Okay. But this is the method to factorize it. First kill the highest degree term, then kill the second highest degree term, then kill the third highest degree term, and so on. So in this case, the, comp the entire computation is pretty simple. So what I get is d of s is equal to 2s squared plus 8 multiplied by half s plus 1. Two S minus J two S plus J two and then S minus S plus two uh, and then this two gets cancelled. Wait, can you do that again? Like so uh, So what is two S square plus eight? This is S two S square plus four. This is two S plus J2, S minus J2. That's what I'm doing. Got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I jumped a couple of steps. Uh, all right, so that's what I'm doing here. And then I have S plus 2 here. Um, and this system is marginally stable. Okay. Okay, so going back to the beginning, I have this denominator. I want to know how many of its uh, roots are in the negative half plane, how many in the positive half plane. I constructed the root array, and I realized that at s raised to 1, I have an entire row that is equal to 0. So I looked at the row above it, and I constructed an auxiliary polynomial, v of s. I did the division of v of s. Uh, we, we divided the denominator uh, polynomial with v of s, the auxiliary polynomial. And then you get the decomposition of d of s in this form. Um, now, in this case, of course, this term is just a single order term, so you kind of know what the 0 is. Uh, but if you have like a complicated polynomial here, then you have to construct the root array for that polynomial, because for this, you already know what the zeros are. Okay. So what the roots of this polynomial are. So, 
So that's what I was writing here. So if your DS over VS was complicated, you'll have to complete another root array just for this DS over VS term. This is my DFS over V of S term. Okay, this half S plus one. Is that clear? So that's how you tackle the case three. We'll, we'll move on to case two now. Questions? No? So because the uh, your DS is stable, that means the whole thing is stable, correct? Uh, so this doesn't have negative real part. Doesn't have negative real part, but it's on the imaginary axis. So you have two roots. Let's do the pole zero diagram. So I have, these are the three poles of this system. Uh, because of these two poles on the imaginary axis, this is a marginally stable system. So if you give it an impulse response, you will see an oscillation throughout the time. Um, on the other hand, if you give it a sinusoidal response with omega equals to two, the oscillations will grow and go to infinity. So therefore it's marginally stable because for some inputs you have bounded output, for some inputs from, for some bounded input you have unbounded output. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So like when we solve this problem, should we write like ds over vs equals one half s plus one or do we like Format. Oh, format, okay. Well, you do this and then you, you can write ds in this form. Now if this term is very complicated, then you have to, of course, give it some other name, ds over vs equals to q of s, and then write the root array for that particular q of s. But in this case, it's simple, so I'm not drawing a root array for, for this term. Okay. okay. So it really depends on the problem. Usually, of course, in the class, we won't go through uh, very complicated transfer functions, but in reality, you will have to write perhaps a MATLAB code to compute this root array for a more complex system uh, and figure out where, whether it's a stable system or not a stable system. But this is just a, an algorithm to write that code. Can we talk about what a marginally stable like, root array looks like yet? Or so this is exactly what happens when you have a marginally stable system. You'll have a row that sort of vanishes. Yeah, all zeros. Okay. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention is when you, are, when you are developing the root array, it's very easy to figure out whether your system is stable or not. For marginally stable systems, you have to do a little bit of work. Okay, you have to figure out. So when you get this polynomial, uh, you will have to uh, you'll have to write down the d of s. You have to factorize the d of s into the component polynomials, and then you have to look at the roots of individual polynomials. Now, in this case, this is easy to see. This is easy to see, so you don't have to create another root array. Yeah. So, if the row is all zeros, is it like only marginally stable, or could it possibly also be like unstable? Like, why do we it could possibly be unstable too? Yeah, so yeah. Right, but it could be unstable for a very specific reason. So you will have, um, so single pole, uh, not single, but a pair of poles on the imaginary axis or multiple pairs of poles on the imaginary axis doesn't lead to instability. But if you have a double pole at the imaginary axis, then that leads to instability, okay? Or if you have a, uh, a single, uh, S as one of the factors, then it leads to instability. And then, so when we do the root array again yeah. on this one, are we not going to see any zeros if it's marginally stable? Like, is there going to be, like, what are we looking for when we do the second root array? Oh, so you are, so root array is used for stability analysis, okay? So if you, you will get marginally stable system only if you can identify whether... So we have to like look for it in the... That's right. Okay. In most of the situations, you will be able to figure out whether 
you have double poles on the imaginary axis or not, even if you have a six degree or seven degree polynomial. If you go higher than that, then of course you have to do a little bit more work. You'll have to construct root array for individual components of the transfer function. So is this just like, um, like in terms of big picture, is this just our way of assessing system stability for higher order systems? Yes, yes, because quadratic polynomial, you can find out what the roots are. Three degree, four degree, five degree, you don't know what the roots are. There's no closed form expression for figuring out what the roots are. But you still want to make sure they are in the left half plane, not the right half plane. OK? Yes? So like the zeros of D of S are the poles of the transfer function? Uh, that's right. So this is the denominator of the transfer function. Oh, OK. Remember, G of S is yeah. N of S over D of S. Yeah, this is just a polynomial, just yeah. Okay. So V of S is auxiliary polynomial, D of S is of course the denominator polynomial of the transfer function, and this would lead to another polynomial, which in this case is half S plus one. And if it was more complicated, you would just That's that right, word. this one. This one has complex roots, this one has a real root. Like if it was a more complicated transfer function, you would have to do the root array. That's right, for individual components. Okay. In this case, it's easy to see. In this case, also, it's easy to see what the roots are. OK? All right. So let's look at another DS for case two. S raised to 5 plus 2S raised to 4. OK, I need to fill in the entries for S raised to 5. So what should the entries be? 1, 2, 11. 1, 2, 11. And then S raised to 4, that would be 2, 4, 10. This is minus 1 over 2, determinant 1, 2, 2, 4. So this is equal to 0. And then minus 1 over 2, determinant of 1, 2, 11, 10. What is this number? Six. six? Yeah. I guess I'm going to put a zero here. I'll see if I need it for constructing the root array for S2. Uh, so now I have a problem here because this is equal to zero. So I can't compute S square term. So I'm going to replace it by epsilon. And this epsilon will take positive value because this 2 is positive. A positive small re uh, real number. 
Now I need to compute this one. 2 epsilon 4 6 and then minus 1 over epsilon Okay, what is this equal to? 12 minus 4 epsilon, 4 epsilon minus 12 over epsilon. And this one is Yes. Uh, there is a negative sign right outside. So this is 12 minus 4 epsilon. That gets multiplied by a negative sign. So that makes it 4 epsilon minus 12 and over epsilon. OK. Uh, I don't think I need the third term for computing the root array for S1. So let's do that. Let me call this uh, some number. I'm trying to see if there is an easy way to compute it or not, because this looks like a horrible expression. Uh, well, let's do it. <laughs> oh, there is a negative sign here. Epsilon. Let me call this some number C. What would this determinant be? Minus. And this will be zero. Let me call this. C B ten zero. Ten. Okay. So now the root array is constructed. Okay. Now let epsilon go to zero and let's count how many sign changes we have in the first column. So 
So we assume that epsilon is a small positive quantity. So I have positive, positive, positive. Uh, what about this? For values of epsilon very, very small, this is negative, OK? What about this? For values of epsilon very, very small, this is going to be positive again. And this is, of course, positive. So I have two sign changes. One here going from positive to negative, And then from negative, I go to positive here when epsilon is very, very small number. OK, so two sign changes. It means that this polynomial has two roots in positive half plane, two roots with positive real part. This one? Yeah. The 10 epsilon over C. C is right here. C is this number. Do you see this? Yeah. Oh. OK. Yes. Uh, we are always assuming that epsilon is very small, and if this is positive, we assume that this is positive. Okay. Okay. So we have two sign changes. It means that there are two roots with positive real part. If I had just given you this expression and I'd asked you whether it has roots. How many roots it has in the negative real part and how many roots it has with positive real part, you wouldn't be able to say just by examining this, uh, this uh, denominator polynomial. But by constructing the root array, you are able to ascertain that this is a fifth order polynomial. It will have five roots. Two roots have positive real part, so which means three roots will have negative real part. And there are no, uh, there will be no uh, roots on the imaginary axis because we don't have a zero, um, zero row here. OK? Yes? So to determine the root, or like the sign of the root, so you just look at what um, plugging epsilon going to zero right. would give you. And then, so, so then you just take that at face value if you have like. Yeah, just <laughs> epsilon re equals to 10 raised to minus 15. Just take a small positive number. Uh, of course, this is positive, so epsilon is positive. So I take a small positive number, and then I see the number of sign changes uh, everywhere. OK? So in this case, you have, like, let's unravel this. So you have 4 minus 12 over epsilon, right? Uh, now, 4 is a number. It's a large number. But 12 over epsilon would be very, very large. And therefore, this term will become negative. OK? OK, any other question? Yes? So like once we did the, the root array and everything, right? We could double check it using a calculator, right? Like just well, like yes, nowadays, yes. But we are talking about 1870s right now. We haven't yet reached 1930s, OK? So we are still in <laughs> 18th century. Oh, sorry, na would it be 18th or 19th century? 19th century. So we are still in 19th century. We have to get to 20th century in perhaps a couple of classes. Yes? Sorry, um, just to clarify. So then we have one negative sign in the first column. And so that means that there's two sign changes. You have two negative signs. Well, yeah, there you have one negative sign. That's right, yeah. And so we're counting the sign changes. So it goes positive. Two, negative yeah. Negative yeah. Positive. Negative to positive. Yeah, that's right. Yes? If the one and two are both negative, then would your C term <clears throat> be positive in a side change? Just like hypothetically? One and? So like you see where the S5 and S4 are, the one and two? Right. Like those were both negative. 
then would your S2 turn the one that like SC would Oh, 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 that's a good question. So let's, uh, let's look at it. So if I have this is negative and negative, then I'll put negative here, and then I'll put a negative sign with this epsilon. Oh, I don't know whether it is zero or not. Oh, it is zero. Okay, so I'll put a negative epsilon here, and then I'll do the rest of the calculation. Okay, so then yeah, would your s squared then be negative as well? Because are you going to plug in a really small negative number then? Uh, so epsilon is always assumed to be small positive number, so that's why I put a negative sign here, so you don't have to put. You don't have to assume epsilon to be a negative number. Epsilon will be positive. Negative epsilon is negative. You, you see what I'm saying? If you construct the array and then pick epsilon to be some negative number, then you will get into trouble. Because then this will be a positive number. And we don't want it to be a positive number. Question? Yes? So you still plug in the positive epsilon. Epsilon, yeah. And below, below in the next step. Uh, so I haven't computed this completely. So should we do it? Maybe we should do it. Why not? OK, so you don't have to copy it. So let me just do it quickly. Uh, so I have minus 10 plus, so this is minus 6. Uh, you have minus 2 minus epsilon minus 6 and 4. What is this going to be? Minus 1 over minus epsilon. So this is 12 minus 12 plus 4 epsilon over epsilon. Oh, OK. All right, so this is that number. Now here, I have minus 1 over minus epsilon. Ten zero. so this is 0 minus 10. It seems to be a lot of work. <laughs> OK. Then I have 1 over C. Which one? Uh, oh, yeah, of course. That's right. OK, that's great. So I have 1 over minus c determinant of minus epsilon c minus 6, 10. minus, no, 10 epsilon, uh, this is plus, so negative 6c over c, and then 0, and let me call this b, I have minus 1 over b, determinant of c, 10, b0, and that's equal to 10. OK, so now this is uh, constructed. Root array is constructed. Let's look at the sign changes. So I have negative, negative, negative. Uh, so epsilon is a small positive number, so I have negative, negative, negative. Uh, this is positive, so one sign change. This term is positive, one sign change. Uh, this term. Let me write it this way. So epsilon is a small number. C is a large number. So this term is going to go to 0. So I have negative sign. So I have negative, 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 positive, negative. So two sign changes. And then another positive number. So I have three sign changes here. Okay. So sign change number 1. Sign change number two right here. 
and then sign change number 3 going from S1 to S raised to 0. So since I have 3 sign changes, I have 3 roots with positive real parts for this transfer function. Okay, That was a good exercise. <coughs> now if you have multiple rows that become 0, uh, you try to divide it by auxiliary polynomial or if you have 0, 0, 1, then you put epsilon, epsilon, whatever the number here is, right, and then start constructing the root array. So if you have uh, so if you have a row that is completely zero, you try to follow this procedure. If you have row with many zero entries, you try to replace all of them with epsilon and then try and construct the root array. You do that only if it's creating a problem. So if you put a zero here and it starts creating a problem at a later stage, then you have to put an epsilon here and then continue constructing the root array. Okay, so we don't have time today, so I guess I'll do it in the next class. But I'll be happy to take any other questions you may have. Okay, no questions. So what I'm going to do in the next class, we'll talk about another example for constructing root array with uh, multiple epsilons floating around here and there. And then after that, we'll talk about relative stability, which is an important concept, uh, which tells you how far are your roots in the negative half plane, okay? So if you're close to imaginary axis, your response is going to be very sluggish. No, uh, yeah, very sluggish. If you're far away from the imaginary axis, your response is going to be very fast. So we want to know what's the relative stability, which means how far is it from the imaginary axis. Uh, the reason why relative stability is important is, you know, when you're flying an aircraft, the mass of the aircraft changes substantially over the period of one flight, right? So you have certain parameters, certain physical parameters, in the transfer function, which would change as you are running the system. So it could be the mass changing because the fuel is getting burned. It could be the temperature changing because the engine is getting hot. Uh, or it could be something else, you know, something buckling or some other physical parameters of the system changing. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you have sufficient stability margin so that even if your poles perturb a little bit, you don't become unstable. Okay, so that's why relative stability is important. And we are going to talk about relative stability and then study some control design techniques um, for creating stable systems. All right, thank you. And I'll see you in my office hours right after this as well as next week on Monday. Thank you. Wait, don't you have officers? Wow.